This is Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. Wherever you're listening from, welcome. I'm your host, Colin Hansen, and I'm glad you're here for today's conversation. During the last decade, one in 20 Americans has shifted from identifying with a religion to claiming, quote, nothing in particular. And this group is also the least likely of any position on religion to hold at least a bachelor's degree. Hmm. Those are just two of the many findings that jump from the page in Ryan Burge's new book, The Nuns, where they came from, who they are, and where they are going published by Fortress Press. Together with atheists and agnostics, uh, the sociologists will categorize, categorize this nothing in particular group together as the nuns. Well, today, as many Americans don't affiliate with any church, as belong to any major religious group, and that's, that's just a dramatic transformation we're talking about, perhaps one of the largest, well, easily one of the largest religious trends in the last 40 years years. Burge's book seeks to explain how these so-called nuns grew from statistically irrelevant to around one quarter of the entire American population. Burge is an assistant professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University, and he's also been a pastor in the same American Baptist church for the last 13 years. So his work goes beyond the descriptive into the prescriptive. For example, he observes that among the nuns, Christians should focus on this nothing in particular group which is open to returning to religion. Well, Ryan joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss the implications of his findings for evangelicals, for black Protestants, for the mainline, and for politics. And I'll ask him why so many Americans left the church between 1991 and 1996, and his best guess at the most significant cause behind this trend. Ryan, thank you for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thanks, Colin. My pleasure to be here. All right, let's just start off with evangelicals. That's going to be most of the people listening here. I'm sure many would assume that evangelicals have declined as a share of the population due to the rise of the nuns. True or false? False. false. Actually, in my new book, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America, coming out in March 2022, myth number one is that evangelicals mm. are in decline. They are not in decline. And I had, a t I had an op-ed in the New York Times last week where I described why I think that's happening for two reasons. One, that more and more non-attending Protestants are grabbing onto the evangelical label, right? Because they're seeing it as a cultural identifier as much as as a theological identifier. But also we're seeing a lot more non-Protestant evangelicals. So Jews, Catholics, Hindus, Muslims are all saying in larger proportion today that they are evangelical than they were five or ten years ago. And it's a combination of factors for them. One is they go to services a lot. The other is they're Republican. So there's kind of melding this idea in their mind that to be evangelical means to be religiously um, active and devout, but also to be conservative theologically and politically. So if you check all those boxes, you check the evangelical box, whether you believe in Jesus or Muhammad or whatever else. So evangelicalism is not declining, but it's becoming less focused on Jesus Christ and more focused on the politics and the culture of the 21st century. So Ryan, that is an argument that has not gone over well with some evangelicals. Let's try to anticipate some of those objections is there any other plausible way to look at the data that you're trying to that you're trying to synthesize and explain for us? Like, is there any other explanation for why this could be happening? Yeah. So a lot of people just say it's like measurement error. So people are just like mashing buttons when they take the survey and they're like, well, evangelical looks cool. Let's hit that button. The problem is if it's a random error, then in every way with a survey, it should look different, right? Because if it's random, then it should look random in the data. However, in every single survey year, the same factors predict that evangelical identification every single time. So it's happening, if it's a, an error, it's happening systematically, which in my mind means it's not an error, it's people are choosing it for a very specific reason. The pushback I'm seeing more than anything else is that people are having a hard time wrapping their head around the fact that evangelical is not a theological term anymore. You know, no one owns language. I think that's something that I've had to learn the hard way. No one gets to tell me what a word means. When I give it to a survey respondent, they get to tell me what the word means, not the other way around. And so if someone says, my Angelou said, if people show you who they are, believe them, 
if you tell me you're an evangelical, why should I not believe you? I can't come in and say, wait, 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 you're a Hindu. You can't be an evangelical. Maybe we should dig beyond that and say, but what are you really trying to tell me when you say that you're an evangelical? And what does that tell me about American religion, American politics, American society and culture, which I think is actually in some ways more profound than by not asking them the question and just going on the fact you cannot be an evangelical Muslim, which I don't think is true. Well, yeah, remember, Ryan, you're speaking with the editor-in-chief of the Gospel Coalition, and one of the reasons that we exist is because of the very problem that you're identifying here, is the the loss of the integrity of the term to be able to have connotations of historical, confessionalism, theology, I guess. But I don't see what you're saying as being inconsistent with that. Like, we can both at the Gospel Coalition be focused on trying to change that reality, but that can still be the reality that after 40 years of being told that if you're religiously observant and you vote Republican, that means in some way you are an evangelical. And if you care about these issues, it seems as though many people have nodded their heads and said, guess I'm an evangelical then. I think it's brilliant branding if you sit back and think about it. I mean, <laughs> going back for 40 years, evangelicals have told us, you know, to be really religious, not just lukewarm, but really on fire for what, you know, for God. Let's use God, the more non-sectarian term, right? If you're on fire for God and you're a conservative, that means to be an evangelical. And so I think it, it, it would be surprising if we did not find that people are picking up the term who are non-Christians because they're they're learning that branding means a certain thing. And let's be honest— our world and your listener's world is not the world, right? Yeah. Like we all live in these bubbles, like where if you're, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably swimming in evangelical circles. You're right. reading evangelical magazines and websites and Twitter feeds and all that kind of stuff. The average person thinks about religion probably 1% as much as you do as the audience. So it tells you what one that 1% looks like for them, what they're sampling and what it's actually sticking in their head. And they hear that word evangelical and it sticks deeply in their craw and says, okay, I know what that means. To be really religious and to be Republican is to be an evangelical, which, you know, I mean, if that's what they think it is, I'm not to be the one to tell them it's not. But we need to think about what the implications are from a survey perspective, but also a theological and cultural perspective, because I think it changes everything when it comes we think about all those topics. It's not your job to tell them that they're wrong, but it is my job to tell them that they're wrong. <laughs> Go ahead, Colin. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> well, I, I might actually uh, reverse the order of what you're talking about there, because I'm I'm not sure it was if you're religious and you care about these issues, then you're an evangelical. I think it was more of if you're if you care about these issues and you're religious, then you're a Republican. Mm. And and we, there have been so much emphasis on co-belligerence. Um, of what my mentor and Timothy George and others would describe as co-belligerence of focused on these social issues, on abortion, on gay marriage, on religious liberty, things like that. And those are really the issues that animate a lot of evangelicals. And so it's almost as if the theological concerns that divide us have taken a back seat to these pressing social issues. So it's almost like if you're religious, then you'll be a Republican and as we know, religious Republicans are categorized as evangelicals. So there's been this sort of quiet and sl this is how academics work, quiet and slow moving revolution in social science about religion and politics. Um, so 10 or 20 years ago, most people who did religion and politics in America were actually evangelicals at Calvin and Wheaton and yes, places like that, right? right? Yep. The last 10 years or so, that generation has retired and been replaced by a new generation, let's say that's less evangelical. Right. A lot of them are atheists, agnostics, or sort of in between all those right. things. And they've actually begun to challenge a lot of the assumptions that we used to make in social science. We always used to assume in religion and politics that religion was first – yeah. And then everything after that was second. So you yeah. looked at politics through a religious lens. And in the last five years or so, we've we've really kind of destroyed that whole paradigm. And now we're starting to see the world. Po the political lens is really the first lens in our eye. Our perspective is framed and shaped deeply by our politics. So we're looking at religion through a political view, not looking at politics through a theological worldview. And if you think about it that way, it really changes the way that we understand everything that we do in the political world because people are now reading the Bible looking for political talking points. And I think that 
that is a huge shift in how we think about social science. And it's actually going to change how we do social science over the next 20 years. And I think it's going to get closer to how actually people think about the world, not how we thought they used to think about the world. Let me give you one example that may uh, support that thesis and one yeah. that may challenge it. Sure. Uh, one that would support that thesis would be the data on marrying across religion and marrying across politics. Mm -hmm. Is it not true that people are far more willing these days in America to, to marry across religion? They don't see that as much of an issue. In fact, they tend to see that an uh, anomalous or analogous to race. As long as they're not atheists. No one yeah, wants their kid. Okay, yeah. good point. That's yeah. the caveat. No one wants their kid to wear. Mar I'm sorry, atheist listening to this. I don't know why you're an atheist <laughs> listening to this, but whatever. Hey, I'm um, glad you're an atheist listening to this. But go, yeah, keep going. Go, yeah, go ahead. But I mean, if you look at the data, people do not. I think like 60 percent of Americans think you have to believe in God to be a good American. Like so, atheists are just yeah. like so maligned by every aspect of culture. But beyond that, no, people don't. People are so. And my wife's Catholic, and I'm Baptist, no. and it works fine. You know, like it wasn't yeah. an issue for us. And I think for most Americans, are like. What is the issue? I don't see the issue. But politically, no one wants to marry. No That's one, what I was going to point yeah, out. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, the, but when it comes to marrying across politics, yeah. those divisions are increasing Absolutely. from what I've seen. Yeah, the data says like when it comes to like marrying someone from a different political party, there's so much resistance. And by the way, it goes both ways. This isn't yes. like one is tolerant of the other and vice. No, no, no. They both don't like each other at this point. <laughs> Shout out to my shout out to my father in law. First question he ever asked me: Are you a Republican? First question. <laughs> did you fail? <laughs> oh, I succeeded. At, I succeeded at the time. I did. I did succeed. Um, but uh, yeah, first question. No, I, I. I mean, did not ask me any questions about religion, um, but did ask me about politics. And now, now here's a here's a question. I'm really just working through, so this is not so much a direct challenge. But is this a chicken and an egg thing? Is it possible that no people do think theologically or through religion first but it's just all of you academics who don't understand religion who keep foisting the politics onto us all the time listen first off i'm a pastor okay so if i don't understand religion i mean i probably don't to be honest with you i think about that do i really understand this i don't think i do um but the way we can actually kind of dig into that's what's called panel data which is where we ask the same people the same questions like at multiple points in time across a long period of time. And you can see which one moves first, right? So you can okay. see like their politics moves or their religion moves. And I'll give you even some from my own research because I actually do publish peer-reviewed stuff from time to time. I looked at panel data that asked the question, do you identify as evangelical or born again in 2010, 12, and 14? And I tried to figure out what the predictors were. Like what happens after you become born again? Like do you change your – Church attendance, by the way, you don't really. Only a third of people attend church more after they become born again. And hmm. do you change your political affiliation? The answer is no, which is really interesting because – and my reviewers hmm. push back and go, how can that be true? We think born again is Republican and da 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 Here's what I found. A huge chunk of people who said they became born again were already strong Republicans before they made the switch. So there's nowhere on the right of that question to go to. So it kind of shows you like they were already strong Republicans and what they're doing is aligning, right, all parts of their social life behind a political identity. So to be a strong Republican is to be a born again evangelical. And so what they're trying to do is say, I'm a consistent person, right? I'm not cross pressured. Like I was thinking back in the day, like union members who are gun owners were like, what do I do? You know, like, who do I vote for? <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Right. We try to align everything that we do behind this single ideology, which is political in my estimation. And so we don't see that cross pressuring thing anymore. And I think, by the way, we're only talking about evangelicals. I think it happens yeah. on the other side of the yes. spectrum, too. Right. Yeah. People throw off religion because to be a liberal, a political liberal yeah. in America today is to not be religious at the same time. So, well, and I, and I, from what I understand from the from this book and from our other conversations, that is a major thesis for you for why the rise of the nuns. Absolutely. I think I think atheists have a religion and it's politics. I, I mean, I think that's an underdeveloped thesis and I've been writing about it a little bit. But, you know, I wrote a piece called the most politically active religious group in America today is atheists. People are like they're not a religious group. And I'm like, well, they pretty much are because they act in a very specific way in a, in a concerted way. They 50 percent of atheists gave money to a candidate or campaign in 2020. 50 percent. Oh yeah. 50. 
Like that's insane. Like you got to look at donation rates in the general population. It's like 20%, 25% and atheists are 50%. And it's not just education, by the way, if you control for education, they still do more stuff politically at every educational level compared to Protestants and Catholics. And mm. interestingly enough about atheists, over the last three years, they see themselves as moving further to the left of the political spectrum, and they see the Democrats moving further towards the middle of the political spectrum. Wow. They actually see themselves – the average atheist sees themselves to the left of the Democratic Party, and they're very proud of that fact. Like, right. So that tells you something. Like, they're, We always talk about extremism on the right. Atheists are pretty extreme politically on the left at the same time, yet they don't get the same sort of – you know, backlash and anger. And I think they're just as problematic and as non-compromising in some ways um, as evangelicals are on the other side. So really what we're seeing is like polar opposites of each other. And what um, they're doing, I think, is evangelicals are dragging all other Christian traditions along with them, like in their wake. And I think atheists are doing that on the same side with the nuns on the left. They're kind of pulling the agnostics with them and the nothing particulars are going with them at the same time. So they're really driving this whole conversation in my estimation. Hmm. Now, is one of the problems you run into, Ryan, with the with your analysis that you're speaking in terms of the normatives, like this is what people say, this is the aggregate here, you're trying to draw conclusions. It seems like the challenge is that whenever somebody's, whenever you're talking with somebody, they can always point out exceptions to it. And so, for example, when you talk about people aligning in their lives, I sit there and say, yeah, my mom was a Democrat her whole life, and then she became born again, and then she shifted the Republican Party. Okay, so that's an example. So that's contrary to your thesis, but it can both still be true that that's the case of what I've seen in my life, but that's not how most people behave. Let me give you a 30-second graduate methods <laughs> lecture on this, okay? There's a great book called Suicide by Emil Durkheim. Right, it's the really the first piece of quantitative social science that really exists. And Durkheim was interested in why people kill themselves. So he went around to all the morgues around Paris, all the different districts, and got all the death records, which they used to collect really cool death records. They had like age, gender, race, religion, all this stuff. Mm. Right, trying to figure out what were the social determinants of suicide, and if there's a pattern that can be seen. And I'll never forget my very first semester in grad school. Our professor said, listen, Durkheim was not interested in why Bob committed suicide. He was interested in why people like Bob committed suicide. Uh, okay. And I always think about that, right? Like I'm – and this sounds awful as a pastor, especially saying this. I'm I'm less concerned about why you came forward on a Sunday morning than why people like you come forward on a Sunday morning, right? What are the – we have to overgeneralize as social scientists. Otherwise, we're kind of spinning our wheels, and we can tell you nothing because we have to nuance and caveat and do all that kind of stuff. I can tell you sort of the mainstreams of what caused these things. But there's always going to be exceptions, and I love hearing from exceptions. Don't get me wrong, but I also have to say to them, you do realize you're a unicorn, right? Like um, your experience is not typical. Here's what's typical. And I think for a lot of people when I do these talks, they kind of get that – the light in their eyes lights up. They're like, oh, wow, that that was me or like at least that yeah. explains part of the journey that I was on in a way that I did not understand. It wasn't just happening to me. It was happening to literally millions of people right. at the same time, and we just didn't realize it. Yeah, let's add a little bit of social psychology to the mix here and say that the reasons people may give you, as in me, a pastor, or you, a pastor, for why they did something may not actually may not be the actual reason they did it. That may have been the rational explanation that they give because it's defensible, but there may have been any number of other intuitional tribal factors that led to that. Your social science is helping us to see those tribal markers. Um, now, let's talk about African-Americans. I'm interested to know how their trends differ from the majority white population. And I'll just go ahead and, and toss the stat out there. This was staggering. Um, from 17.7% nuns among African-Americans in 2008 to 32.1%. In 2018, now there's a kind of a big world historical event that happened between 2008 and 2018 that I think has something to do with this. But why don't you go ahead and explain a little bit of where you're coming from yeah. on uh, why that matters? Because that's, that, that's, that is an anomalous jump, is it not? Oh, for sure. Uh, but can I just give a little caveat to that jump? Yeah, do it. If you look at the the breakdown of the type of nuns amongst African Americans, uh, so nothing in particular. Eighty eight percent. Okay. Eighty eight percent. Yeah. Okay. Which is way different than white people. Like yes. white people are like, I'm atheist. I'm here for it. By the way, forty eight percent of atheists are white dudes. 
48 percent are white dudes like and they hate me telling that but i'll just put it out there again like they're so white male dominated it's incredibly problematic for a whole bunch of you know they're all like liberal and like we're all about being woke and having all these different voices go look at the atheist uh, books Mm. top 25 books on amazon right now and 21 of the 25 are written by white dudes i mean it's a problem for them but going back to african americans i do think the obama election was actually really interesting for them because obama so Obama went to a church, and if you read in his book, his his biography, autobiography yeah. that just came out, he kind of says like, yeah, I like church, and I wish I would have gone more, and it used to do some stuff for me. But he really kind of has like a mainline you know, sort of view of church, which is like it was fine, and it was social, and I had a good time, but I just sort of drifted away over time. I think in some ways that gave – oddly permission for a lot of black Protestants to be like, wait a minute, Obama's a black Protestant and he went to a black church, which he did go to one of the most historic black churches in UCC. Chicago. Yeah, yeah, UCC. Yeah. UCC mm-hmm. church, which is like, you know, it's like steeped in tradition and Jeremiah, we can right. talk about Jeremiah Wright and all that kind of jazz, but whatever. Mm-hmm. But I think what he did was gave permission to a lot of black Protestants to go, wait a minute, I don't have to go to church that much because Obama doesn't go out to the church that much. But here's the other thing that was going on. America was secularizing rapidly between 2008 and 2018 and I don't think it'd be folly for us to assume that any racial group would somehow be immune to that secularization sure. because it's just it's like a wave and it crests on every shore. Right. And that's I think in the book, I try to make this point. You don't people think secularization is like young, white, liberal, you know, college students. Hmm. It is not. It is right. every demographic now. It is every racial group. It's every uh, income spectrum, education spectrum. And, you know, African-Americans, by the way. Interesting backlash we're seeing in the African American community. They actually were more pro Trump in 2020 than they were 2016. Right, they were right. more pro pro Trump in 2016. They were pro Romney in 2012. Right. We're seeing them trend to the right. And what we're seeing is that's especially amongst, and this is a really interesting combination, young African Americans who go to church weekly are becoming more Republican every year. Hmm. Because I, I think what they're doing is they're seeing like, wait, I'm a real. You know, I'm a real evangelical. I'm a real black Protestant, right? So I want to hitch my wagon to the Republican Party because they speak for me. I've always thought the Democrats have a huge problem on their hands, which is they got the atheists right over here, right? Woke leftist atheists. And on the other side, they got the black church ladies, right? Who are like, I don't know about the gay people and I'm not cool with abortion and all this kind of stuff. Like, how do you square that circle and keep both those groups happy? So like, you know, the the Equality Act that was kind of bouncing around. Right. That right. would, to me, Biden did the right thing because that was poisonous to his coalition. Because no. if he pushes that, the nuns love it. Every Christian group hates it. Yeah. So it's Democrats, Republicans have it easy on that because they're like, oh, yeah, that's terrible. Biden does not have that choice. He's, he's in a much more difficult situation. But I do think that Obama had sort of a, a pulling effect, but I don't know how much it was Obama versus just how much the culture overall was shifting away from religion and, and what you can blame Obama for and not. Yeah, so that's what makes this conversation and reading your book so fascinating because you give the data, you give your you, you you give your interpretation of that data and even some application of it. But there's plenty of room for debate within both the interpretation and the application of that data. And so one of the things I thought about between 2008 and 2018 was it depends on which story you want to tell. Because you could concoct a story where you say, well, what happened between 2008 and 2018? Well, it's the ubiquity of smartphones. Mm. Smartphones and the rise of violence uh, initiated by police against African Americans and the spread of those videos. And the response of Republicans or white evangelicals to those videos may have been something that pushed a number of African Americans out of the church because they didn't want to be associated with that at all. Mm-hmm. Or you can tell a different story. The story can be first black president, proud moment for the country in many different ways, also transformative when it comes to attitude on sexual issues and especially on gay marriage. Mm. And so that tension begins to grow of the traditional Christian beliefs on these topics, but also the pride and identification with this candidate. And so some African-American views begin to shift. As you point out, almost everybody's views shifted during that time. But perhaps it was one of those things that, you know, President Obama being the vocal spokesman on that issue and changing his mind 
Well, he changed his mind to run for president first and then changed his mind again to run for president second time. But um, then his but his sort of using that bully pulpit to push that issue, lighting up the White House, everything like that, that might have created more of a separation. I mean, th- those are probably both plausible surmises, I suppose. Right. But there's That's, no way of knowing. I feel like we're in a graduate seminar right now, Colin, uh, <laughs> talking about the last 10 years and how maybe and this is this doesn't play well on TV. Maybe this stuff's complicated. Yeah. Right. And maybe there's multiple explanations for things. But I, I do think that Obama, the Obama transformation on gay marriage is super interesting because Biden switched first. Remember that? Yes, of course. Well, and in classic Biden fashion, apparently without any communication with the rest of the administration. <laughs> exactly. He got out, yeah, I think he was just talking off the cuff somewhere and just like, eh, gay Wait, marriage I forgot cool. this wasn't our official policy. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute. He probably walked off stage and was like, hey, you guys need to like figure out a way to make that make sense to the rest of the White House now. And, and I, I'm sure Obama was like, what? And like lost his mind that day. And he was like, well, there goes messaging for the next week. You ruined it, Joe. <laughs> But you know what? In, in some ways, yeah. in some odd way, you could say like he actually helped Obama because he kind of drug um, him and said, you got to come with me now because it's already out there. And we can't be divided on this issue. Well, and I, but I think the reluctance was precisely the issue you're identifying. It is the black church's attitudes yep. on these topics. And I think there, there, was, there was that tension. Now, I, I will say that um, I don't think – the Democrats are going to run first into the problem with African-Americans, it seems. And even as we're recording this episode in the aftermath of, of, a, of an off-year election, mm-hmm. it seems as though the bigger issue for Democrats by far is going to be how that hits with, with Hispanic voters. Oh, that's – to me, Hispanic voters are really the key vote over the next two or three years because, listen, we assumed they were going to stay, stay where they were in 2016 and 2020, right? They shifted hard – towards Trump. There's there there's some counties around the border, like in Texas, it was like a fifty point swing towards Trump in twenty sixteen versus twenty twenty. You know, Miami Dade County was the same way. Florida would have been a toss up if Miami Dade County would have gone the way it went in twenty sixteen. Right. And but the thing is, they're cultural conservatives. A right. lot of Catholics are they're Hispanic they're Hispanic Catholics, Hispanic evangelicals, right? right? Social issues matter a lot, but you know what else matters to them? Things like policing and immigration. Right. And I think Biden, Biden's got this big, the Democrats are so, oh gosh, the, the Democrats are never unified on anything. And I think it's killing them right now, especially when it comes to things like infrastructure and this, whatever, we're going to build back better plan or whatever they want to call it. That is the Republic. God love the Republicans. They are at least unified on stuff. They'll vote. Uh, they'll vote as a block. Democrats got too many thoughts about things. <laughs> well, that's just kind of what I mean of all these things. Politically, re- politics, religion, it's all intertwined in ways that are easy to polemicize mm-hmm. and easy to cherry pick, but hard to synthesize. Yep. And so one of the things you talk about in this book is the shift of 5% of Americans disaffiliating from religion just between 1991 and 1996. Explain to me why that's not entirely Pat Buchanan's fault. <laughs> I was thinking about Pat Buchanan the other day. Like, what is he up to? He's like sitting around, cashing his <laughs> book royalty checks, talking about how cool the speech was, the culture war speech in 1988. Or not, yeah, 92. It was 92. 92, that's, yeah. That's, that's what I'm getting at. That's, yeah. that's that's exactly what I'm referring to. Man, that's a cool mo- moment in American history. Like, no one thought of it at the time, but like, it's just hung around. So, you know, I, I think that the 90s were this odd and I'm actually going to write about this in my third book. I think the nineties were when everything changed in American life. Like everything possibly changed. 7% of Americans were nuns in 1991. And then it jumped to, you know, like 12% by the end of the decade. Think about what was going on though, right? Who gets elected in 1994 contract with America, Newt Gingrich. And what kind of politician was Newt Gingrich? He was a bomb thrower. And I think he'll tell you that today. Like he was not like the old school, like Tip O'Neill, George W. Bush, Mm -hmm. we're all going to get along kind of politician. He's like, no, the Democrats are evil and they're going to die and we're going to beat them. You know, like he was not there to play nice. And I think people, they they latched onto that for whatever reason. But you also got to think about where we were in terms of culture. The Summer of Mercy happened in like 1990, 1991, where people were like laying in front of cars in front of abortion clinics and like really right. like the abortion – anti-abortion movement like hit its all-time peak in terms of anger and violence and all, and murder, right, in that early 1990s period. And that's when politics became like we have a different view of abortion to know abortion is murder, and if you you know participate in it, you're a murderer too. So I think that galvanized everything. But then you got to think about what was going on religiously, Falwell. 
is at his yeah. absolute peak of power, right, in the early 1990s. Pat Robertson is right alongside, which, by the way, Pat Robertson won the Iowa caucus in 1988, and yeah. there was discussion that he was going to knock Bush off, George H.W. Right. Bush in the primary. So there's all these factors coming together at one time, but the other thing that's going on is I think technology is just starting to creep into American life at the same time. So by the end of the 1990s, internet in the home did not become ubiquitous, but it became something that a lot of people had. And in the book, I talk about this fact. Imagine you're an atheist born in Mississippi in 1940. You might live and die and never tell a single soul that you don't believe in God because they would kick you out of the house, right? But if you were an atheist born in, let's say, 1985 in Mississippi, now you can go online and Google atheists in Mississippi, and boy, you got a subreddit, and you got a forum, and you got yeah. all these places to feel like community. So right. now you are going to say what you are on a survey, and other people are going to look at it and go, well, that gives me permission too. So I think technology sort of opened the door for something that was always fermenting for a long time, but then just really yeah. kind of all came together in the early 1990s. Yeah, I would— uh I probably wouldn't emphasize the technology piece as much, or maybe just the internet was slower coming to South Dakota during that time. But what I do recall as a mainline, chi uh, mainline child in the 1990s was the Southern Baptists and Disney. Oh, and I remember yeah. watching Bill Maher in my room, mm -hmm. you know, debating against the likes of Josh Harris um, <sighs> on his show. And so I remember this distinct experience of being an evangelical in the 1990s, a new evangelical in a mainline home of just how loathed, hated my religion was. Mm. That was the feel. I felt I felt largely alone in that, and I felt like the world just hated me. And a lot of it was the backlash to things like the Southern Baptists and Disney. Yeah. And those but they, they set themselves up for it, though. Don't you think? Oh, that's I know. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So I'm not I, I'm I'm just saying that this affiliation seems to have been concentrated at a time when there were very high profile social issue stands from the religious right that were deeply unpopular. That's right. But I think that's evangelicals like to play that us versus them game, right? They really like oh, to course, create yeah. in versus out. And I think that's really good. And I always talk about this. That's really good for keeping people in. Right. But it's not really good for bringing new people in, right? Because it creates this wall between evangelical culture and the rest of culture. Yeah. And I think the taller you build that wall, you're cool. As long as your your people are making kids and they're keeping them in the in the camp, right. you're fine. What we understand, though, is that evangelicalism has become a leakier boat as the time has passed. And so you can't just keep be, be happy building the tallest walls you possibly can if evangelicals want to grow. And not, by the way, not evangelicals like I talked about earlier, like yeah. real evangelicals, you know, yeah. the ones are Protestant. Right. You've got to bring new people in. And the more you set yourself apart from culture, honestly, the harder it is to do that. So it's always a dance, right? Yeah. A social dance of how you play that game. Well, I think um – I would argue biblically, theologically, and also historically that you you do need those barriers. I guess I'm a little bit of a Rodney Stark um, folk when it comes to this, or Larry yeah. Hurtado or others. But I would say that that's a different argument that I'm making there from the argument of when you're talking to somebody who's not an evangelical, they assume that that also means, or even primarily means, they need to love Donald Trump. They need to have this view on immigration. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a barrier that is a totally different deal, as far as I'm concerned, as opposed to the barrier of Jesus saying, yeah, you know, you, you got to die to yourself if you're going to live for me. That's a barrier, but, too, but that's an actual biblical one. No, I agree, but I don't think people see it as just a biblical one Oh, anymore. I know. No, you know? I, that's, that's the problem. So I think you're describing barriers that I was just talking with a group of campus ministers last week, and the barriers you're describing are the barriers that they are struggling against yeah. in their evangelism every single day. I'm saying, let's get back to the barriers that are actually in the Bible. <laughs> oh, no. There's I, plenty you, of them there. <laughs> I, no, I agree. Like, it's hard enough to be a Christian as it is, but when you right. add the layers of politics and culture on top of that, I think right. that's – but I think the thing is, like – the Southern Baptist Convention has lurched hard to the right over the last, you know, five or ten years. Right. And and don't tell me that has nothing to do with the fact that they're they're losing people. Like I, I don't think that you can separate those two things together. And I think, and this is what evangelicals tell me. Well, good. Some people say, well, good, because now the real Christians are the ones that are left. I think that's a toxic worldview. Can I just say that? Like, I think that's a toxic way to think about things. Like, I want people who are, who are real true believers who are left. I mean, my, you know, I'm an evangelical in that I think that 
people should come to church, whether they're there for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, and mm. they'll stay for the right reasons eventually. Like, I don't want to be in a situation where the only people there are the people who believe 100% have been Christians from they were eight years old and got baptized in a river, you know, out back of the farm. There needs to be people there who are marginally attached that'll go, hey, I'm willing to listen to the message at least today. Yeah. Even though I don't believe any of this stuff, and I'm here because we're having free barbecue afterwards. That's cool. Like, <laughs> I, that's that's my whole perspective is you get people in the door for whatever reason you can, and then if the message sticks, it does, but get them in the door, you know? So I suppose I suppose the dividing point there, and I, I see where you're coming from, and I want to translate that into terms that I think make a lot of sense, at least for me, which would be, what's your attitude toward Christmas and Easter Christians? In other words, if you're a pastor and you say, what an opportunity, yep. the, these folks, they may not he- be here for the right reasons, or they're, they're here on Mother's Day because their wife just told them, all I want is for you to not complain about coming to church today. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or, you know, this is just what we do as a family for Christmas or Easter. We get dressed up, we take the family photo and we do that. Mm-hmm. Your attitude can either be to be warm and inviting and welcoming and say, this is an opportunity to teach them something and maybe something will click. Maybe the spirit will work in their lives, or Mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for me to shame them for the fact that they obviously don't care enough. Otherwise they would come the rest of the year as well. Um, I can see why a lot of pastors are frustrated about that. I guess my attitude would be to see it more as the opportunity for evangelism. Is that a little bit of where you're coming from? Man, you operationalize that that so well, Colin. That's really it. I mean, okay. when you, like, I think so many pastors like like look at those people and chastise them. Like, you should be here next Sunday. And it's like, they should no. be here next Sunday, but don't <laughs> tell them that. You should, the work happened when they got dressed and they got, they got in the car and they drove to the church on a cold December night to come, you know, to come to a Christmas Eve service. They no. made the effort. And I think we need to honor the effort that they made. Don't chastise them. They're not there every Sunday. And if, guess what? If you chastise them for not being there. I don't think that turns anyone on. I think it turns a lot more people off to say, well, I don't want to go back and get yelled at, at least not this Sunday. It's Easter, for goodness sakes. Like, you know, be nice to me on this Sunday. Let them come. Let them enjoy it. And if they find it to be welcoming and enlightening and inspiring, they're going to come back. I mean, that's... I guess that's my. I'm too mainline. I guess in my approach. Yeah, you're now. too. You're too American Baptist, not Southern Baptist. I'm sorry. We need I, to explore the role of shame in a Southern Baptist <laughs> life. I think that's another podcast we need to talk about. Um, yeah. I, I got so many other questions. I got to keep going on this. Give me the one top reason for mainline Protestants declining from thirty percent to ten percent in four decades. Oh my goodness. Um, because they were too close to the nuns. They really didn't believe anything in the first place. And so it's just easy to kind of go mm, one step to the left and I'm out of church entirely. Right. So it doesn't, if it's not life changing, then what is it? And for a lot of them, it wasn't life changing. It was just cultural. Right. Yeah. And culture shifted, you know, societally, you know, we've shifted away from religion. And so it's easier because remember, we talk about the walls. I think the mainline walls were really small, right? Like one brick tall. And it was easy to take one little step and go to the left and become a nun. Cause you don't have to go to church on Sunday then. And that's cool. Like that means one less thing you have to do on the weekend. So I think theologically that's an answer, but can I just say also demographically, yeah. they were a bunch yeah. of old white people and old white yeah. people live for a while, but they die. Yeah. And a lot of it was like, people are dying off. That's actually, I think what killed them. This to me, there's two ways the main line decline. The first one was for like 1975, to like 1995. And that was the one I was just telling you about. A lot of them became nuns. Cause they're like, yeah, whatever. The, the second wave is just demographic decline. Cause the people who were left were old people who were just going to die and their kids weren't part of the church anymore. So they weren't being replaced. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give my, my quick thesis on this. And I, I would say that, at least in my understanding of the main line, as again, somebody who comes from that background, I would say the last moment of great heroism, that the sort of the hero narrative is connected to civil rights. Hmm. That would be a good example of where their liberal inclinations brought them to the correct conclusions in many cases. And so there's a heroic narrative of how so many Southerners, so many evangelicals were not involved, but they were mainliners, people like James Reeb. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, now he's kind of beyond even the main line there. But I mean, people like that on the left of religion, they were the martyrs on the front lines working with the conservative black Protestants in many cases. The problem after that is that the sexual revolution just wreaks havoc yeah. there in terms of the divisions inside the church. Now, civil rights was also divisive, but not in the same way as because it could be seen as a Southern problem. 
Whereas all of a sudden this affects the entire country um, in terms of the sexual revolution. So it seems as though I, it, as though like, I just, I've never seen the main line be able to recover from the divisions that came out of that. At least that's my, my guess. You know there. what? I just thought of something like a cool UC, Jim Reed was a UCC minister, you know, went from yeah. Boston to the South and got killed basically trying right. to, you know, help civil rights. Right. That would be a great campaign for like white mainline Protestant churches to run today. <laughs> saying like yeah. we were, we were leftists on race stuff like, yeah. you know, 50 years ago before everyone else was on the boat. Like, I yeah. don't think that I bet you 95% of young people have no idea that yeah. that was actually happening. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Well, it, no, it, it is, it's kind of a, it, it's kind of like a Woodstock reunion is what it feels like now. Mm-hmm. It's where the older people will gather to talk about that. But I would say one of the arguments there is that more or less there was the mainline view is what prevailed politically. Mm-hmm. And when the mainline view prevailed politically, it took away the religious urgency of the movement and therefore they lost a purpose and then what replaced civil rights well the debate over feminism and the debate over abortion well again that that really just decimated those ranks from the inside and those consequences are still being felt today um with with all the denominations having split the united methodists being the the last and the largest to be going through that now um all right, oh, can I make a book reco about yeah, that? Yeah, Anybody interested do it, do it. in this? Yep. Yeah. John Compton wrote a book called The End of Empathy, where mm. he makes this really interesting argument about the main line. Like Donald, he basically says that the reason we have Donald Trump is because the main line collapsed. Because yeah. it used to be the main line would be like, we're not going to vote for that guy. You know, like the establishment mattered at that point. And they would basically tell their membership, like, who was an acceptable candidate and who wasn't an acceptable candidate. And so they would probably would have elevated a guy like Rubio or crew, you know, some sort of more establishment candidate. And yeah. so when we lose the gatekeepers and the establishment for Compton's argument, he basically says Trump is the natural outcome of losing the religious structure. The top down religious structure in America is what leads us to where we are today with this hyper bottom up situation that we're in for good or for bad. Right. Because I think there's good and bad to all that. I think it's a fascinating argument about, you know, what how the main line actually helps society stay in the middle of the political lane and not yeah. veer to the edges. Yeah. But then I would turn around and I'd say Trump, of course, is a mainliner himself. And not anymore. He, he, well, this yeah, he's, he's now. yeah, converted there. But I would say he's the very epitome of Norman Vincent Peale's um, <laughs> sort of mainline Protestantism right there. So I would I would argue that's he is the fulfillment of all of that, where it's not about the actual theology or even the Bible for that matter, but more about self-expression. I think he's the epitome of that, but I'm not going to make you argue with me about but can that. We, right. well, just, just a two second aside. Yeah, can we ahead. just talk about how the last, like think about the last Republican nominees for president, right? Trump, who's yeah. mainline in air quotes, right? Yeah, right. And who we got Romney, LDS, yeah, right. McCain, who was not religious in any meaningful right. way at all. And right. then you got Bush, who was was United Methodist, but evangelical United Methodist. Yeah, evangelical tinged United Methodist. Yeah, yeah. but then you got mm-hmm. H.W., who was a straight up old school Episcopalian cool. mainliner. Right. Like they've not really elected, like a, a, a nominated a true blue, like died in the wool evangelical yeah. in thirty years, which I think is fascinating yeah. if you think about it. Well, and then just look at the Supreme Court nominees. Um, as yeah. well, all Catholic. I mean, if so, evangelicals run the show, why are they not getting more seats at the table? Like that's I don't get oh. that part. Again, this will be for the next podcast that we do. Um, All right. So if you could identify the most significant reason behind the rise of the nuns, again, I'm trying to limit you to one here, which is not fair, but what would you say? Now, we got options. We got abuse in churches. We got political polarization. We got theological liberalism. We got TikTok and Reddit. We got delayed marriage and childbirth or same reason just about every voluntary organization has declined cable television than Netflix. What do you got? I'm going to go, I'm going to go none of the above. And I'm going to say oh, no. secularization is what I'm going to say. Secularization. Oh, that seems like a cop out. That just it seems like total. you put all of that. You just put all of that under the secularization banner. Yeah. But the thing is like, it's so predictive though, because it predicted all. So if you, there's a scatter plot in the, in the book, which I love, which shows like GDP on the X and like people will say religion is very important on the Y and shows like the United States and, and like a bunch of other like Western yeah, European countries and even some African countries. And then China's China's an outlier, obviously, because it should yeah. be more religious than it is, but it's right. not because of communism. America, right. you know, what percentage of Americans should say religion is very important if it was on the trend line? Zero. 
Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Zero yeah. percent of Americans kids have how wealthy we are. We're actually right. very odd that we are much more religious than we should be. We're a huge outlier. But I really do think that the more education and the more income that your country gets, it's just going to throw off religion. We were going the way of Western Europe post. So post-war period in Western Europe, I mean, religion just disappeared like rapidly. It's incredible if you look back yeah. at what happened between like 1948 and like 1960 or 1965. Like the, the culture changed completely in Europe. And to think that it wasn't going to come to America, at least at some level, I think what's more the even more fascinating question is why did it take so long and why did it go so slow? We okay. should be. 40% nuns. And I think secularization explains all that at the same time. Wow. I did not peg you as an old school secularization thesis. Oh, Ask come Lawrence on. Max person. Weber's my guy. Okay. I just, I just did not have you pegged that way. Well, okay. I guess my, without getting into it too much, my counter argument would be, I guess you just say Ireland was, the, was also slow because Ireland was just poor. Is that the argument there? Mm, Catholicism is tough, right? <laughs> because okay. it's cultural as much as it is religious. And okay. on surveys, we know people say that they're Catholic, even though they never go to mass for years okay. and years and years, right? Well, I still, I still think there's something to be said for how Ireland was also one of those outliers within mm. Northern and Western Europe. And you can say Catholicism, but then at the same time, you say, yeah, but what happened? Well, the abuse scandal happened True. and the connect that was a clear before and after. And so that's why I would argue. I do think there are some factors that exacerbate it. I mean, I do agree with what you're saying. Overall, the United States is quickly catching up. Yeah. Probably what I would say, the reason why we've been delayed is because of the uniqueness of Southern history. Hmm. specifically its racial history, its civil war history, and how closely connected that has been to evangelical religion. That's the main reason. I think You know what Stark of, would say? What he would say? Pluralism. The fact oh, that America oh, okay. has always been religiously diverse okay, means we so, have a strong marketplace. So Tocqueville. So Tocqueville's argument. Exactly right. Yeah. That we've all religions always had to fight <laughs> for its market share and therefore right. it's always had to innovate and you know yeah. move forward and be more attractive to people. Right. And in Europe, all the religions basically became state churches and they rested on their laurels. And yeah. listen, if you want to make something go away, make the government adopt it. And we never <laughs> did that in America. So right. I actually think that I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that religion never and in, in most parts of the country you have a diversity of religion and you've had a diversity of religion for a long yeah. time now. And I actually think a lot of people go, okay, I've got all these options and none is an option, but it's one of a menu, right, of options that I have. And I think that's actually made religion relatively strong in America long past well, its expiration date. True. Quick point of order, though. We actually yes. did have established religions oh, in America, yeah, in New I, England, no, in know. the least religious part of the country. So that thesis could also hold there as well. It's the problem, Ryan. We could probably all be right. That's the problem. We're all wrong, Colin. <laughs> well, everything. we're all wrong, but it can be all of the above. It can be secularization and it can be pluralism and it can be Southern. Like all these things can be happening at once. And usually the way I find we get things wrong is when we say it has to be this one thing overall. So Wait, you mean those things online where it says one simple trick that makes everyone mad is not really true? <laughs> I'm yeah, we're just busting all kinds of myths here. Uh, Ryan, in 1970s, the modal or most common age of an evangelical was 24. Now it is 58. Should evangelicals be worried? Oh my goodness, yes. And I've written about this a lot, like the age of the Southern Baptist Convention to be worrying. To, like, I think a lot of evangelicals go, look at those gray haired mainline. And I'm like, look in the mirror, guys. Like, you're like you're five years the, behind, basically. Exactly. You, really, you are like five years behind where they are. If you look like, like where the age distribution is, the fat part of the distribution is like 55 to 65. That is does not portend a very vital future because we know like a lot of those people are going to die off in the next 15 to 20 years. And there's not this huge, you know, crush of evangelicals going to fill in the gap that are left by all these people dying off. And I think, you know, it's easy to point at the main line and say, well, they're dying because they are because, the, listen, you see where the main line is right now. That's where you're going to be in 10 or 15 or 20 years. And here's the difference, though. A lot of mainline traditions have no people. They have a ton of money. Yeah. A lot of evangelical traditions are not as wealthy. You know, like the Episcopalians have the Wall Street Trust. Have you, have you read mm. about this? This is amazing. No. It blows my mm. mind. They they were given land by the queen in the 1700s, mm. which they still own on Wall Street. And it's valued. I've seen estimates value between 6 and $10 billion of real estate holdings they own. The Episcopal Church does. The Southern Baptists have a lot of money, but I don't think they have that kind of money. 
right? And think about non-denominationals. Think about the AOG. Think about all these other little traditions that, you know, that are not that big. The Episcopalians can live on life support for years because they can keep the lights on. A lot yeah. of evangelical traditions, if they start dying off quickly, do not have that financial lifeline to keep them around for a long time. That's the same dynamic within higher education. So a lot of the schools, the, the private schools that Christians had started in previous generations, obviously mm-hmm. they have the major endowments, the Ivy League, places like that, whereas the evangelical schools today almost exclusively depend on enrollment. They don't have the major endowments there. So same thing there. So much more uh, – much more quickly affected by these transformations. So the age thing is a major concern for Christian colleges. Absolutely. That. That's why I don't teach at a Christian college, by the way, because <laughs> five years of bad enrollment and your job's gone because your university is well, gone. Well, I got to right? I got to say, if it's so bad in Christian colleges that you're teaching at a public university in Illinois, then it must be really bad. Listen, I've got (laughs) health insurance that's Cadillac. I've got a pension that's going to keep me in money for the rest of my life. As a Uh, former Illinois resident, I say good luck with that, Ryan. I've got we got a union that I'm not a part of, but whatever. (laughs) Good luck. All right. Is it cause or effect that a woman without kids is almost Mm. twice as likely to be a nun as in no religion, yeah. as a woman with kids. I think it's, I, this is just hypothesizing. Okay. I think what it is, is we all understand there's a traditional conventional way to go through life, right? Which is like, you know, go to college, find a guy or a lady and get married and then have kids and then sort of follow the, and have a job in the house and all that stuff and the dog. I think if you veer off that plan and then, by the way, go to church as part of that whole plan too, right? Like right. raise your kids in church and the whole thing. If you veer off that plan in any way, shape, or form, you're like, I give up. You know what I mean? Like I'm the church – like you know who goes to church? Nuclear families. They yeah. are the ones who go to church. And because I – maybe I'm a single mother, right? Or like I live with my boyfriend or you know something like that. If you veer off that plan, I think that really takes you off the road of religion entirely and you just never feel like you belong there. And I will, I'm not going to say churches cause this because I don't think they cause this. It's just culture around mm-hmm. religion causes this. And churches haven't done a lot to sort of you know mend that fence up. But I think it's more about – the worldview of if you do everything right, then religion is for you. But if you do a few things wrong or maybe not following that path, then religion is not your thing. This is the nothing in particular group that you're talking about here as well. Again, Mm -hmm. I think that's what's so confusing. I try to tell people this all the time. It's the college educated Americans who are far more religious in terms of observant than it is those without College education. One of my myths in my new book is that college mm. m- makes people nuns. There's actually no evidence right. of like it's insane to me like how people believe stuff that's just factually untrue. The people who are leaving church are the lower education right. and the lower incomes too. Right. High. Um, if I broke the income um, into quartiles, so top twenty five, you know, second twenty five. Bottom 25, yeah. the people that are leaving church the most are the bottom 25% of the income spectrum. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, this is a thing. This isn't like everyone online is like, well, once you get some education, you're going to leave the church. No, you're not. The evidence is very clear on this. People who are educated are in church as much as anybody. In other words, the problem is not the life of Julia. You remember that old campaign yes. from President Obama? Yes. Just when you were talking about the life pattern, that was so interesting. I've never seen a campaign able to to kind of map out its demography in terms of a, a new life pattern. But I think it was very instructive and in many ways accurate mm-hmm. of the, 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 the effect of things like delayed marriage and delayed childbearing. Yep. The point is, though, that's not only single women who are going off to do PhDs and then getting married at 35 and having kids at 40. It's also women who are having you know, are getting pregnant at age 18 or mm-hmm. have a miscarriage or something like that. And just life begins to fall apart mm-hmm. for them. That's often why they will leave religion there and never get connected into and build a nuclear family. Um, I'm going to jump over this last, well, the, the second to last question here, because I just want to point people out in your book. One thing that you close with is the advice to preach sound biblical doctrine that cuts across the political spectrum. Gives everybody a flavor for what you're getting at in this book. But the last question then related to that is, do you think this trend can be reversed? I don't think it can be reversed. I think it can be slowed. 
I'm much more of a believer. You can take the, the trend line and curve it down as opposed to like reversing it where it's going the opposite direction. I think it's inevitable that America is going to be less religious in 20 years than it was today and then 40 years from there, right? It's just – we were, and again, going back to the Max Weber secularization Flash, idea. That's the secularization thesis. Yeah. yeah. Like I think, but here's what I think though. And I think this is where we differ from Western Europe. I don't think we get to a point where majority of Americans are non-religious. I just yeah. don't see that in the data. I mean, even amongst Gen Z, the nuns do outnumber the, the Protestants and the Catholics combined, by the way, which is, you know, obviously 45% of Gen Z are um, atheist, agnostic, nothing in particular, 37% are Protestant yeah. or Catholic. So that's not great. But he, here's what I got going for us. Muslims, Mormons, Buddhists, Hindus, all those other groups together, right, kind of mashed together, and they're not going away, right? They're, they're hanging around, and they're actually – there's not a ton of evidence they're growing, but they're definitely not declining, especially amongst the younger generation. They're probably growing somewhat. And we know those groups are younger. Like the average Muslim is like th – the average adult Muslim is 32 years old, like 18, 18 and up. The average oh. one's 30 – like crazy young. Hmm. They have more kids, and they have them younger. All good things for those traditions in terms of like their future survival. I no. think we see America in the future where it's 50% nuns, it's 50% religious people, but it's not 50% Christians. It's probably 35, no. 38, 40% Christians, and then like 10 or 12% of everybody else who are very devout, just obviously in a different way. And the 35% of us will be going to church in Zuckerberg's metaverse. So then we have that to look He'll charge to. you to go because he has no idea how to do anything. <laughs> Can I rent a pew in Mark Zuckerberg? Do you know that like metaverse? when they did that thing with the churches thing, they wanted to they wanted to put ads during the stream, <laughs> and they wanted people to pay to watch the stream. I'm like Zuck, you're worth like a hundred billion dollars, dude. You can't throw a bone to a church where you can watch for free. Like who 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 is your ham fisted PR director? Who's like let's charge churches for this because we've got no money. Like we're giving them, a, you know what I mean? Like it's so dumb. Probably the same atheist who thinks that taxing churches is a viable political way forward until I point out how many how many black and Hispanic churches have you been to and and how many of those folks vote Democratic and how do you think that's going to work in terms of a political coalition? Oh, I, I go, listen, Joel Osteen's church is going to do just fine if you tax it because he'll just go to the people and ask for more money. The, the storefront church yeah. in, in like in urban Detroit is going to go yeah. under in a week if you start taxing it and you want to hurt the small churches are going to die and the big churches are going to get bigger. Do you think that's a good outcome? I don't, and I don't think most people think that's a good outcome. Yeah. It's bad policy. It's bad politics. It's never going to happen. But people love to talk about it on a Twitter, apparently. Ryan, give a brief bur blurb for your next book coming yeah. out early 2022. Yep. It's called 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. 10 are about religion and politics in the combination. So things like um, evangelicals did not support Trump in the primary. That's false. Um, things like um, evangelicals vote because of abortion. I don't think that's true. I think immigration is just as important as abortion. But other stuff like, you know, college makes people secular. People get more religious as they age. That's also false. Um, black Protestants are liberals. Not true. They're moderates politically. Mainline Protestants are liberals. They're not. They're moderate politically. Um, so a bunch of little like 2,000, 2,500 word chapters with a couple graphs just sort of like knocking out things I see online that are just patently false. Um, wrapped in the veneer of, I think if we're going to move through the polarized time that we're in right now, empiricism is the only way forward, which is a focus on data and what we know to be true and looking at the data. Um, you know, I think reje rejecting data and rejecting facts is where we get into problems and we'd be willing to change our, I, in, the, in the very last chapter, I talk about how I compare Donald Rumsfeld to Robert McNamara, which mm. I think is a really interesting comparison mm. because, you know, when McNamara or when uh, Rumsfeld died, not even a couple months ago. Um, there was an, uh, an obituary in the Atlantic that said that Rumsfeld never changed his mind about Iraq. He could just hmm. never, never change. He thought he, what they did was exactly right. And if you look, watch McNamara's life, the Fog yeah. of War documentary that he came out in 2005, he was incredibly introspective about his role in the Vietnam campaign and all the lives that were lost, both by the Vietnamese and the Americans in that campaign. And he almost apologized for his role in that whole thing. And I think we need to be a lot more like McNamara and a whole lot less like Rumsfeld. Changing your mind is not a bad thing if confronted by overwhelming evidence that you're wrong. And hopefully in the book, I kind of do that a little bit. Well, check that out. Um, your point, by the way, on immigration and abortion is the key one, I believe, to people who are – anybody who is confused about evangelical support of Trump. And for any of us who worked in Republican politics for 
say two decades before Trump came onto the scene, the uh, attitude of Republican voters on immigration did not come as a surprise. <laughs> it's kind of a surprise that finally a Republican politician realigned his or her position to the normal Republican voters position yeah. on that. But like you said, it gets very confusing when you think, wait a minute, but evangelicals vote because of abortion. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I mean, some do, but immigration is at least as powerful, if not more powerful. A little them. data point about that. 58% yeah. of white evangelicals want to reduce legal immigration to this country by 50%. 58% want to reduce legal immigration by 50% to this country. Yeah. So – I have a hard time with that whole like, oh, we just want them to come here legally. No, mm. the majority don't. Yeah, and that's because evangelical identity is very closely tied to a certain view of America. Yes. Which is very closely tied to certain racial notions broadly about the composition of America, things that are changing rapidly because of the demographics that you talk about here. So anyway, I think we could have done several more hours of this, but you've been listening to Ryan Bird's talk on Gospel Bound about his book, The Nuns, where they came from, who they are, and where they are going. Ryan, what a great interview. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Colin. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Gospel Bound. For more information, including past episodes, transcripts, and to sign up for my newsletter, go to tgc.org slash gospelbound. If you like what you've heard, you may also like my new book written with Sarah Zalstra called Gospel Bound, Living with Resolute Hope in an Anxious Age. You can find it wherever books are sold.